Good morning, how are you? Well, I think that uh, we can all relate to that little skit on some level, can't we? Uh, so for the past 10 weeks, 10 weeks, we've been going through the Ten Commandments and uh, exploring how it applies to the modern family. And today, this morning, we have reached the end of our journey. And, uh, you know, <laughs> as a preacher, it's always reassuring when you announce that you're end of a, a long series. It's reassuring when people actually don't applaud, <laughs> right? Like, we're done, finally, right? So thank you for that. Um, uh, the Tenth Commandment is where we're at this morning, and uh, you can follow along this morning in your, your church programs. We have some notes for you there, and uh, we'll be referencing a variety of, of verses from the Bible. If you need uh, an extra notes or a pen or something, just raise your hand, and we'll have some people uh, drop one by you. Um, but you'll see uh, at the top of that page the Tenth Commandment, which is found in the book of Exodus, chapter 20, verse 17. And it says this, you shall not covet anything that is your neighbor's. You shall not covet anything that belongs to your neighbor. So some like to describe coveting more simply as kind of like a, a greed or a jealousy or a kind of envy. But, but what coveting is at its root, it is, it is this uncontrolled desire to acquire. That's what coveting is. It, is. it is an ungoverned, insatiable desire to possess what does not belong to you. Right? It's, where, it's where you begin to lose control of your want for things, and your want for things actually begins to control you. And the Bible is clear that this desire, it's, it's toxic to the soul. Jesus even says in the book of Mark that coveting is one of the many sins that pollutes a person's life. Um, now, before I get started, I do want to say this. I do want to say that the desire to acquire things, the desire to get things, uh, actually, it's not really bad in and of itself. Um, uh, acquiring wealth isn't sinful. That's not the message this morning. This is actually to, to, the desire to go out and collect and acquire and accumulate. You know, it, it's a feature that God built into all of nature, uh, into all of his, his creation, um, you know, I was, like, for example, I was, I was at this wedding over 4th of July weekend in Boulder, Colorado, and uh, it was a stunning wedding. It was held in the, in the backyard of, of the host, and they lived, uh, their, their backyard is adjacent to this huge open field and this beautiful creek, and there's, like, wildlife, and it's, it was just, it was amazing. And the reception was, uh, was in their backyard. They had this huge white tent where they set up all the reception tables where everyone dined and danced, and it was amazing. And, and uh, Right in the middle of the food, right? Food has been served. Everyone's enjoying a, a wonderful meal. The cat from the host home decided to go out into that field and to carry back into the dining area a huge, fresh, juicy rat. <laughs> and it was just like, it was just like, waltzing in like as proud as can be and this thing was like dangling from its mouth and it was not like an old crusty rat this is something i mean it just caught this thing and um and you know like you can't really you can't really blame the cat he was just doing cat things it's built in him to go out and and to to collect and to acquire and to ruin parties with things like dead animals right i mean we we see this we see this feature built into God's creation, we see that God created the birds and they have this desire to go seek out and to collect material to build their nests. We see that God, he made the ants and they have this insatiable desire to, to go out and collect the food from your kitchen, right? We, we see it in all of God's created order. We all have this natural desire to acquire and accumulate things to a certain extent. And, uh, God, you know, God didn't fill the world with all kinds of exciting and wonderful and good and desirable things. Just say, hey, don't touch that. Hands off the cookie jar. Right? He's not just like flaunting in front of you just to tease you. So the desire to, to acquire things, to get things, is not bad in and of itself. But when it becomes uncontrolled, 
when that desire becomes ungoverned in your life, when it becomes an insatiable desire, it is a problem. So God isn't so much against the desire to possess things, but rather what he's against is things possessing you. And there are some things that, there are some things that you are just not meant to have. And there are some things that are simply not yours to want. And God knows that if you do get that, that it could very well cause harm to your life and, and cause harm to your heart. And so it must, that desire must be controlled. There must be proper governance over your wants in life. And can we just be honest for a second this morning? We're at church. Let's be honest. This can be really hard to do. Am I the only one that finds it's hard to do sometimes to kind of to kind of get this control under wraps to just govern my wants in life? It's not easy. I mean, we we shouldn't even pretend that it is, because we, the culture that we live in, we live in a culture that it insists that that you always need to want and to get more to be a content person, to be a happy person, to be a fulfilled individual. Be content with what you have. Be content with where you're at in life. I mean, this just isn't part of our cultural vocabulary. But as I mentioned, if, if we don't get control of this desire, if we don't get control of this, of this desire to get more, it will become toxic to our soul. And this is how, okay? This is how it becomes toxic to our soul. Always wanting more will lead to debt, in your life. It will lead to debt in your life. All kinds of debt. So yeah, sure, it, it can lead to financial debt, but it can also lead to physical debt, emotional debt, relational debt, spiritual debt. I just want to take a second to, to explain what I mean for a second, all right? So you can fill this in as we go along. So let's look at this, that always wanting more will lead to financial debt. In the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 5, verse 11, it says, When goods increase, those who eat them increase. In other words, when you acquire more food, there will be more people who come out of the woodwork to come consume it for you. Uh, to put it even more plainly for us today, you can think that, you know, you, you can, as a person, you can think that, that getting more money will solve all your problems in life, but when you do get more money, you'll discover that there's just going to be more opportunity to spend it. There's just more ways to spend it. There's just more ways to lose it. And this is why 44% of those who have ever won large lottery prizes go broke within five years. And that nearly a third of, of these winners have declared bankruptcy, meaning that they're worse off than they were before they got filthy rich. Right. Coveting, coveting, it, it, it will devastate your budget. And we usually think that the problem is that we just don't make enough money, but really the problem is that we just want too much, isn't it? And what's often the case is that, is that when we fall into, into this trap of, of coveting, it's, it's that we, what we're doing is we're confusing our needs and our wants. And so we tell ourselves that we're justified to, to spend the extra money on things because we, we tell ourselves that it's going to fill a real need in our lives. But the, but the reality is that most of these things that we spend our extra money on are just a means to satisfy an appetite in our life. And so we justify that, that spending and we spend more and we spend more and, and it causes us to get further and further in financial debt because it costs more to have more. Always wanting more will also lead us into physical debt. You see, in our drive to get more and to get more, we push ourselves to overwork and we overextend ourselves like way past the limit. And when we work too hard for too long, man, we're just going to eventually burn out mentally, physically. And so we drive so hard to acquire things so our, so our families can be happy and, and, and we, we drive so hard to... To, to acquire things so our kids can have it easier, which in theory, th th it's, it's a really good idea. But the road we take to acquire it all, it can be so strenuous and so unhealthy that, that it saps everyone's joy and happiness. We're just exhausted by the time we arrive at our goal. Proverbs 23, 4. It says, do not wear yourself out to be rich. 
but have the wisdom to show restraint. And so if you want something, you need to ask yourself an important question before you resolve to go after it. Is the end worth the means? Is the end result worth the cost that you're going to pay to get there? Always wanting more will also lead to emotional debt. Emotional debt. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 12, it says, The sleep of a laborer is sweet, but as for the rich, their abundance permits them no sleep. No sleep. Tossing and turning, stressed out and anxious and worried. Why is there no sleep for the one who covets? It's because if you're so worried about getting more, if you actually do get it, you'll be twice as worried about losing it, right? Getting more will then amplify your stress and your, and your emotional strain, right? How am I going to protect all this now? How am I going to invest it all to, to grow it even further? How am I going to ensure it in case I lose it, right? People think that becoming an instant millionaire is going to bring them the life that they always wanted and, and just like relieve the stress and worry of life, but, but it's, it's just not the case. In fact, a lot of the times it's, it's the total opposite. Can I, just, can I just quote for you one more fact about these, these, these big lottery winners? Uh, there are studies that say that they frequently become estranged from family and friends, and they incur, they incur a greater incidence of depression, drug and alcohol abuse, divorce, and suicide than the average American citizen. And financial planners even joke that if you have enemies, just give them a lottery ticket. <laughs> right? And so here's the point, is, is, that, is that a life lived simply Man, a life lived simply of just spending what we have on things we actually need, I mean, it, it just isn't as prone to the same kind of frustrations. It isn't as prone to the same kind of stresses and worries. It isn't as prone to the same kind of emotional debt that plagues those whose primary concern in life is to accumulate and to increase and then struggle to preserve it all. Always wanting more will lead to relational debt. Relational debt. James 4, 2, it says, You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and you quarrel. Relational conflict will invariably surface when we cannot control our desire for more. It's going to happen. What's the number one cause for divorce in our country? Financial tension. These fights and these arguments that we have, right, that, that lead to broken marriages. The source of them is, is these, these fights and arguments over money. It's over possessions. It's over our stuff. About how much should we get and how do we save it and how do we protect it? How do we manage it? Right? My, my insatiable desire to acquire more and my drive to get more, well, it, it not only affects me and not only affects my heart, but it affects all those around me and, and those who are closest to me, and it, it affects my marriage. It affects my relationship with my kids. It, it, it leads to relational debt. And then, of course, there is the, this 10th commandment, right, that it specifically says this, says, you shall not covet anything that is your neighbor's. You see, the reason why coveting is, is such a problem is that it's not just a sin against God, but it's a sin against other people. Within the original context of this commandment, coveting things that belonged to your neighbor was so sinful because it focused greedily on the property of a neighbor that was his or hers rightful share in the land that God had promised. So that desire to have what they owned, it threatened their basic right, and their, their basic God-given right. And you cannot do that and love someone well at the same time. You know what I'm saying? And, and this principle, this, this command might have been given thousands of years ago, but the principle still remains for us today. That, that we're, we, we shouldn't covet somebody else's job, covet somebody else's car, house, wife, husband, bank account. 
Because either God has given it to them or God has allowed them to have that. And so if we, if we desire it to own it ourselves, we're not only insulting God, but we're not loving them well, are we? Covening ruptures good relationship. And always wanting more leads to spiritual debt as well. Spiritual debt. You know, we exert so much energy and effort to acquire things, you know, because we think that in some way it's going to bring us some type of fulfillment in our lives. And let's not deny it. I mean, getting things, it, it, it feels great in the moment, doesn't it? Doesn't it feel good to get things? It can bring some kind of happiness. It can feel fun, at least for a little while. But when we're talking about real and lasting fulfillment, well, God says that there's nothing in this world that can do that for you. There's nothing in this world that can do that for you. The book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 5, verse 10. And by the way, I'm quoting a lot of verses from this book, and it just so happens to be written by a guy named King Solomon, who was considered to be one of the wealthiest and most successful people alive in his time. Uh, he says this in verse 10. He says, He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. It'll never be enough. You know, several weeks ago when I, when I preached on the second commandment uh, about not having idols, I, I shared with you a little quote from a guy named C.S. Lewis. Um, He's a, a dead Bible scholar, theologian, philosopher, and uh, I, I thought I would share with you the same exact quote because it's just so relevant to what we're talking about. So I'm going to, so bear with me for a second, all right? This is what he said. He says, a car is made to run on gasoline, and it would not run properly on anything else. Now, God designed the human machine to run on himself. God himself is the fuel our spirits were designed to burn or the food our spirits were designed to feed on. There is no other. God cannot give us a happiness and a peace apart from himself because it just is not there. There's no such thing outside of God. You were made. You were designed and shaped. You were made to find satisfaction in Jesus Christ. Not this world. God designed you in such a way that real and lasting fulfillment can only come by God in his love. And so that's why no matter how excited we get about something in this world, no matter how good it feels to acquire something in this world at the moment, sooner or later, we're going to grow bored of it. We're going to need something bigger. We're going to need something better. We're going to need something newer. We're going to need something prettier, trendier. And this is why getting more things in this world, it just does not lead to a happier life. It actually leads to a more dissatisfied life. Otherwise, the richest people in the world would be the happiest, and that just is not the case. It often leads to an empty feeling life. It leads to a kind of debt that exists on a spiritual level. Isn't it amazing that you can be so rich in this world and yet have the worst kind of debt, this debt on the level of our soul? Because our soul is deprived of the one thing that can actually satisfy it. So where does true contentment come from? How do we find it? All right, from what we've talked about so far, I think we can safely rule out, rule out that content, contentment it does not come from having more toys or from enlarging our wardrobes. It doesn't come from going on more vacations. It doesn't come from eating out more often or from acquiring more money. Contentment is not so much from great wealth, but it, 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 it's more about having fewer wants. You see, we need to understand that contentment is it's an internal disposition. Contentment is more about what's going on in here than what we see out there. Contentment is more about what's going on in here than what we see out there. And so I want to share with you this morning just four practical things that will help us posture our lives in such a way to experience real contentment. 
It is, as I call it in your notes, you can see it there, the road to contentment. So number one, write this in, avoid comparing myself to others. Avoid comparing myself to others. Comparing yourself with other people, sizing yourself up to what they have without fail will kill your joy and contentment. Every time. And I think, I think we all, to some degree, we, we struggle with this. We all fall into the comparing game. And it's hard not to. But why do we do it? Why do we all fall, in, fall into it? It doesn't matter who you are, how successful you are. We're all looking around. And it's because in, somehow we have come to believe that this is the way you keep score. This is, the way, this is the way we determine if I'm good enough. This is the way in our mind we've come to believe this is how I va ev evaluate my value. Right? I mean, we're all insecure people. And so we look around and we ask, how am I doing here? And it's just, it's easy, right? It's just easy to look around. How am I doing here? Well, I guess I'm better than that guy. I'm not, not as good as that person. And, and what often we do is we, we fall into this, this lie of, of we determining our self-worth by our net worth. Because it's easy. It's just right there. But 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12, it says this. It says, when they measure themselves by one another and compare themselves with one another, they do not show good sense. They do not show good sense. You know what God thinks is foolish? When we make the people around us the standard by which we evaluate our self-worth and approval and value, God thinks that's foolish. Because let me tell you, looks can be so deceiving. Looks can be so deceiving. And what I mean is that, man, you can look at someone else and you can see their amazing house and you can see their awesome cars and their cool job and their good looks and their trendy clothes and their super hit blog and their wonderful life on Instagram. And then you look at yourself and you say, what am I doing wrong? What are they, what are they, what am I missing? And we end up depressed. We end up beating ourselves up. We, we think, man, if I could just do what they're doing, if I could just have what they have, then my life would be complete. Then I would feel better about myself. Then I would be worth something. Then I would be happy. But the truth is, is that looks can be deceiving. And on the surface, there may be some beauty and some appeal. But just because someone has all that stuff, it doesn't mean that they're not lost and broken like everyone else. And in fact, they could have a lot of shiny things to flaunt in their life, but they could be the most egotistical and uncaring person you've ever met. Romans 3.10 says that there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who is perfect. There is no one who has it all. I know it can sometimes seem that way when you see the photographs online or when you see them driving by in their car or you see them at the gym or whatever, but... No one's got it all. No one's perfect. We're all messed up. We're all broken. We all need Jesus. So you might want to ask yourself again, is this person really the standard I want to measure myself by? Is this really the person that I want to, to be the measure, the standard that I determine my self-worth and my value and my contentment in life? Proverbs chapter 14, verse 30, it says, a heart at peace a heart at peace gives life to the body, but envy rots the bones. Man, a heart at peace. Isn't this a beautiful description of what it means to be content? A heart at peace. There's nothing, there's nothing so life-giving like a heart full of tranquility. You know, when we, when we adopt a sense of peace and contentment about who we are, about what we have, where we're at in life. But when we start to look at other people's lives out of, out of jealousy or envy and with the desire to have what they have, what it does is it eats away at our lives like a cancer. It eats away at our joy because we'll be anxious and dissatisfied with what we have and it'll eat away 
at our values and our integrity because we'll feel the need to sacrifice them to get what we want. It'll eat away at our relationships because we'll feel the need to sacrifice them to go satisfy ourselves and our own self-interests. Do you really want to be content? I'd say rather than comparing yourself to what others have, let's learn to celebrate what others have. Let's, let's love people enough to rejoice in their successes rather than, rather than to desire to have it for ourselves. I guarantee you, if you see someone being successful or increasing in their life, or they're looking great, or life is going their way, or they're getting blessed, I guarantee you, if you get behind them and you celebrate with them, I guarantee you're going to be filled with joy. Yes. Absolutely. But if you just want what they got, man, you're going, to be, you're going to spiral down into bitterness and resentment and depression, and why is that not happening to me? Second thing, the road to contentment. Take delight in what I have. Take delight in what I do have. Have you guys ever heard uh, what's called a dumb criminal story? You guys familiar with that terminology? Dumb criminal story. Uh, you might have heard them on the radio. Sometimes they share these on the radio when there's a really good one. Um, uh, I'm sure BuzzFeed has a bunch of articles about this kind of stuff, but... Uh, uh, dumb criminal story. It's kind of like, um, you know, someone's robbing a house and they get caught because they decide to sit down and make themselves a sandwich and take a bath, right? Or something like that. It's like, what are you thinking? Um, I once read a dumb criminal story about a 24-year-old young man who decided to rob a bank in Ottawa, Canada. And uh, he was arrested for robbing a bank of $6,000 and then sent to jail for six years. Now, he had used, to rob the bank, he had used a 45 caliber Colt semi-automatic, which actually turned out to be an antique made by uh, the Ross Rifle Company from Quebec City in 1918. And this was a big deal because the pistol was worth up to $100,000, <laughs> which, if I'm doing the math right, is much more than what this guy was caught stealing. And in fact, after they sent him to jail, they sent his gun to the museum. True story. You can't help but think that, that if he had just recognized what he had carried in his hand, he wouldn't have robbed the bank because he had everything he needed right in the palm of his hands. It was right under his nose. He already had it. You know, I think that sometimes we're so unhappy in life because we fail to recognize what we already have in our possession. It's right here. The book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 5, verse 19, it says, it says, All to whom God gives wealth and possessions and whom he enables to enjoy them and to accept their lot and find enjoyment in their toil and work. This is the gift of of God. If you like to circle things, underline things in your Bible, in your notes, I want you first to circle this is the gift of God. And then what I want you to do is I want you to take an arrow and I want you to draw it from that and circle it around and point it to, to enjoy them. This is the gift of God, to enjoy them. God's saying that he wants you to learn to be grateful and enjoy what he has given you. And not be so fixated on what he's given someone else or he has not given you. This is the gift of God. God's gift to you isn't the possession. God's gift to you isn't the wealth. God's gifts, gifts to you is not the thing itself. The gift is the joy-filled experience we get from enjoying and taking delight in what he has given us. That's the gift. Did you know that God, God takes delight in watching you enjoy what he has given you? He loves it. I mean, if you're a parent, I mean, you can appreciate this, right? Because I love watching my kids enjoy what I've given them, and it fills me up. And God enjoys watching you enjoy what he's given you. And I believe that when you can truly 
take delight in what you do have. You can actually tap into a contentment and a joy and a peace that exists within God himself. Because get this, God himself takes delight in what's his. Did you know that? We see it all over in scripture, like in the creation story, when God created something, when he created anything, he beheld what he had made and he said, it is good. So before moving on to the next best thing, he stopped, he paused, and he delighted in it. He enjoyed what was his. And so when you take delight in what you have, you make it possible to taste of the very peace and contentment and joy found within God himself. God's saying, I want you to share in what's in here, and it's so good. God's got this perfect peace. He's got this perfect contentment. He's got this unbreakable joy, and he wants you to tap into it. He says, take delight in what you do have and what I have given you. 1 Timothy 6.17 says, God richly provides us with everything to enjoy to enjoy. This is the gift to find ways to enjoy what God has given you. The third thing is to prepare to give what I have to help others. Prepare to give what I have to help others. You know, despite what you may think, God does want to bless your life. I think that there might be some people here this morning that are convinced that God does not want to bless you, but he does. God does want to fill your life. But he doesn't just want to bless you for your own benefit. His design for the blessing he has given to you is that it would then flow through you. That's how he has designed it to work. And in fact, I think you'd find that that blessing would really enrich your life to its fullest extent when you do allow it to flow through you. He wants you to share it. He wants you to use it to help other people. There's a verse in the Bible that says, to whom much is given, much is required. Which, in other words, God, God is, when God is going to give you something, he's watching to see how you're going to use it. He's watching to see how much of it you're willing to give away and use to help people. In 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 19, there's this larger passage. I'll read this with me. It says, as for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, which is prideful, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in what? Good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. You know, it may be possible that you stopped four words into this passage and saw that it was being addressed to the rich, and you just simply assumed that it did not apply to you. It applied to other people in this room. But uh, let me just say this. If you're living in this country, if you're living in this county, if you know that you'll be able to eat lunch and dinner today, if you know that you're going to have a home to sleep in and a bed to sleep in tonight, and, and when you're thirsty, you can just take your cup and push it against that little button on your refrigerator and get clean water. And when you're at a cereal, you can just hop in your car and go to the grocery store to get more. And if you have clothes to wear for the rest of this week and you have access to a machine to wash it all for you, you're rich. Even if you don't make a great income, even if you don't think you live in a great area, out of the seven billion people on this earth, you are considered one of the richest. And now notice, notice that this passage, I mean, it's not cutting down the wealthy. It's not saying like, hey, hey, tell the rich that they're bad. That, that's bad. Bad, bad, bad. Stop it. That's not what it's saying. Now, the Apostle Paul, he's writing to this guy named Timothy, who was a, a young church leader and pastor, and he's saying, tell, tell the rich in your faith community not to be focused on their wealth but rather focused on the needs of other people. He's saying, tell the rich that, that real wealth, if they want to be really wealthy, man, it's not determined by counting coins, but by counting the ways you can give and serve and help other people. That's wealth. That's treasure. In the book of Acts, chapter 20, verse 35, it says, Remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, It is more blessed to give 
than to receive. It is more blessed to give than to receive. More happy are those who give than those who receive. You know, I don't think I've ever met a greedy person who is happy. Have you? Have you ever met just like a, just a totally greedy person that was just the happiest person you've ever met? I don't think so. I, I think this is such a universal truth. It, it's, it's, it's so much so that we create caricatures out of people like this. Like Ebenezer Scrooge, right? It's just something we, we understand to be true. Real contentment, true joy, genuine happiness, real peace of heart is found in the act of giving, not receiving. You know, when I was a little kid, I could not wait for Christmas because of all the stuff that I get. And I remember sitting down months ahead of time, writing my lists and uh, submitting my lists. And, uh, and then when it came time for, for Christmas and there were presents, man, I'd just tear into those presents like a wild animal. <laughs> you know, the biggest bummer of Christmas morning is that you know, I have two older sisters, and so there's three of us getting presents. And the way our family worked is that we had to take turns uh, opening presents. So I don't know what your tradition is, but we would take turns opening presents. So we'd all have to watch uh, each person, right? So, so it just drove me nuts. It just killed me that I had to wait like three whole minutes in between opening presents. It was the worst. But now, you know, what really excites me is thinking about what kind of gifts I can give to my kids. I've got three kids, and I'm getting to the place where I just, that's what's exciting. That's what I look forward to. Thinking about what would bring them delight and making the lists about what I could give them and what could bring them joy. And I get more excitement out of, out of that than, than what I might get. And you see, as, as time has gone on, as I've, as I've grown a little bit since those days when I was a little kid, just tearing into those those boxes, I've, I've realized that contentment is not found in the beautifully wrapped gift. Contentment is found in the gift of loving the people around me. You see, understanding that real contentment is found in, in giving and not getting, it's a mark of, of spiritual maturity. And understanding the difference between being rich in this world and being rich toward God, two different things, understanding that difference is a mark of spiritual maturity. If I want to be on the road to contentment, I need to prepare to give what I have to help others. Now, I should clarify something before I move on to the next point that, you know, what I'm not saying is that if you just go and you do one single act of giving, that your life is just going to be changed forever. You know, like, hey, hey, man, I, I, I just went down the street and I gave a buck at some random charity outside of the grocery store and I don't feel nothing. What gives, man? You said, you said if I give, my life would be changed. I'd be happy. I don't, I, nothing's different. I, don't. I mean, that might be a step in the right direction, but that's not necessarily the mark of maturity I'm talking about. That's not, that's not what will put you on the road to contentment. Look back at the verse that I shared a, a few minutes ago, 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 19, the, the kind of larger passage. Can we pull that back up on the screen, actually? 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 19. There it is. Notice in this passage, it says, it says, be generous and be ready to share. And I, I, I might have even, yeah, it's underlined up there for you. Uh, it says, ready to share. Be ready to share. Don't just share, be ready to do it. What we're talking about here is developing a posture or an attitude of giving. Where, where giving isn't simply a reaction you wrestle with in the moment, but giving is something your heart is prepared to do. All the time. And so if the opportunity should arise to help someone, you then give to them cheerfully and happily because I'm prepared to do it. I'm ready. And not only that, since it's not just a one, this isn't just about a one-time act of giving, but rather a continual posture or an attitude that I have adopted, it means that even when I'm not in the actual act of literally giving right at this moment, you can still live your life at all other times open-handed because you're ready. You can live your life at all other times with a loosened grip on what you do have. Does that make sense? 
which means you'll be so much less possessive and territorial over what you got. You'll be so much less anxious, so much less worried, so much less afraid, so much less worried about letting go and losing something, so much more content. Prepare to give what I do have to help others. And lastly, refocus on what's going to last. Refocus on what's going to last. In other words, spend your time filling your life with what really matters. If you're going to spend your time doing anything, going after anything, spend your time filling your life with what really matters. There's a big difference between momentary pleasure and eternal fulfillment. We need to know that there's a difference between the two. There is a big difference between momentary pleasure and eternal fulfillment. You know, some people, I've had conversations with many people with this kind of attitude and thinking, you know, when they're told that they should give up living for themselves and start following Jesus and do things God's way, they're like, why? They're like, living for myself it makes me feel good. It does feel fun. I like the feeling of getting a lot of stuff. I like the feeling of getting a lot of money. I do feel happy when I get new stuff at the mall. It, it feels good to do what I want and get what I want. So, so why should I give all that up and follow Jesus? I think I can find happiness from these things. So what's the point of, of doing life God's way? And you know what? They're right. They're right in a small way but they're wrong in a very, very big way. You see, we can't deny that getting more stuff doesn't make us feel good, at least in some small way, right? We can't deny that doing things our way and going out and acquiring whatever we want, however much we want, with limitless quantities, that it doesn't, that it doesn't bring at least some kind of gratification. Otherwise, why would people do it? If it didn't feel good, if it didn't feel fun, unless they got something out of it, unless... It made them feel kind of happy. We feel gratified, at least for a while. And so sure, there's some truth to the argument, but here's where we need to open our eyes and wake up, is that this gratification we get from satisfying our desire for more in this world, it simply does not and cannot last. It's impossible. Everything you see around you in this world is temporary. Please, don't take this truth lightly. Nothing you see here is going to last. Everything you see around you will eventually decay, will go to waste. It'll burn up. It'll go away. It'll be gone. It'll eventually cease from existing because all possessions and worldly pleasures are temporary. They will not and cannot last. The only things that can stand the test of eternity are things you can't see with your eyes or buy with a credit card. They're things like a relationship with your creator, a relationship with, with people, things like love, things like freedom, things like joy, things like peace, things like worship things you can't see, things you can't buy. So 2 Corinthians 4.18, it says this, says, so we fix our attention, not on the things that are seen, but on things that are unseen. What can be seen lasts only for a time, but what cannot be seen lasts forever. Don't make the mistake of substituting momentary pleasure for eternal fulfillment. Don't do it. The only way to find your way to lasting contentment in life is to refocus your life on what's going to last. You know, Jesus, Ben, you guys, you guys can come up, Ben. I'm wrapping up here. Uh, Jesus, he once told a story uh, about an extremely successful guy who had amassed so much wealth, they had nowhere to put it all. He said, like, what should I do with all this stuff? I've got all this wealth that I've acquired. What do I do with it? And so his solution was to build bigger barns to store it. And uh, he then decided it was a good time to retire, 
move down to Palm, Street, Palm Springs and to pick up surfing. I might have added that last part. But it never occurred to the man to share his blessing. He never once considered giving even a small portion of his huge wealth to help someone in need. And in the story that Jesus is telling, God sees the guy and sees what he's doing, and he says, you fool! And he tells him, hey man, it turns out you're going to end up dying today. So now what do you have to show for yourself? Now what do you have to show for all this wealth? Now what do you have to show for all, this, all these barns and what you put in it? You can't take any of that stuff with you. You won't be able to use it. You won't be able to use it to buy yourself in here. And Jesus makes a comment about his story in Luke 12, 15. He says, he says, take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. In other words, don't think that all there is to life is just stuff and things and possessions and money. Don't think that the only thing of worth and value that you can pass on to your children is money and stuff and estates. Life consists of so much more. Your future consists of so much more. Legacies consist of so much more. Heaven is not made of the same kind of stuff you see in those big barns. Heaven does not function on the same kind of stuff you park in your garage or deposit in your bank. The economy of God's kingdom operates on a much different kind of currency. And that's why Jesus says in this story of his that you can build up treasures for yourself here in this world, yet not be rich toward God. You can be spiritually bankrupt. What God wants, what God wants us to live our lives believing is that there is only one name that can bring true contentment. And that name is not Benjamin Franklin. That name is not Ferrari or Tesla Motors. That name is not Apple or Restoration Hardware. Come on. That name is not the name of your employer. That name is not the name of your job title. That name is not the name of your boyfriend or girlfriend. That name is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, our Savior. It is a name that is greater than any name given among man. It is a name greater and infinitely more fulfilling than anything found within this temporary place that we call the world. It is a name that will outlast every name. It is a name that will outlast every last thing that is on this earth. Why would we shortchange ourselves by coveting things in this world? When Jesus, who is an ever-flowing spring of joy and love, has freely offered himself to us. Would you stand with me? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, God, we stand here this morning believing that our purpose in life has substance. That our goals and dreams are rich in goodness. And that our legacies and reputations are worth something when we put the name of Jesus Christ at the center of it all. And so, Lord, would you help us to posture our lives so that we may be able to live out that belief day in and day out. Give us the strength. Enable us, God. Empower us, God. Give us wisdom. Give us courage to fix our eyes on things that are unseen to cast our gaze upon Jesus, our source of joy and contentment. 
We need you, God. We believe that you are able to do all things. We pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.